Good morning. Good morning. Sounded really good. I hope you've been able to enjoy this wonderful weather we've been having. Uh, I wish that it would stay about this, this weather all summer long. We'd be very, very happy. I, I will say that the, uh, the young people, though, who were going to Pep's Point this morning and to go in, on the water slides there, they were a little concerned that it would be a little too chilly out there. Uh, so I guess we can praise the Lord we're here and not there. Uh, because you know what, when you're young, you can handle that. It's not a problem. Uh, but when you get older, it's not quite as enjoyable. Uh, if you would, please bow your heads as we have our invocation. Father in heaven, we once again thank you for inviting us into your presence. And Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit is poured out here on our hearts May our ears, our spiritual ears, be open to hear the message you have for us during this special meeting. And Lord, we pray that when we leave this, this place at the end of this, uh, this time, as we head to our lunch at the end, I pray that we will go with special treasures in our hearts that will carry us through and will continue the work of transforming us more into the image of Jesus Christ. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Uh, just a reminder here, as far uh, by way of announcements, uh, just to, uh, to remind you that we do have a number of seminars that begin at 1.30 this afternoon. And we do encourage you, if you do not have a program, find one and look at the, the list of all the seminars there. I know every single one of them would probably be a blessing. Uh, every time I come to a camp meeting where they have things like this, I, I think I wish I could clone myself and go to all of them uh, at the same time. But unfortunately, we, we can't do that. Uh, so we just ask you to choose one that really interests you and uh, go and be blessed by that uh, at 1.30. And then again, there's another seminar that starts at 3.30. Uh, so please take, take part in those and uh, grow even more. Uh, our speaker for this morning uh, at our 11 o'clock is Pastor Kerry Fry, and, and would you come out here, uh, my brother in ministry? He serves uh, right now in the Gulf States Conference in the Olive Branch District. And if you don't know where that is, it's a long, long, long way away north of where we are. About how long does it take to get here? 
Four and a half hours. hours. About four and a half hours to drive here. Uh, he said that when he was on his way here the first time, he thought he was about here and said, no, it can't be this far. And yes, it was that far. <laughs> it was that far. Uh, but we're, we are glad to have uh, him speaking to us today, and I know we would be blessed. And let me have a special prayer for you. Father, I want to pray especially now for my brother and uh, in Christ and also in ministry. Lord, please bless uh, Pastor Fry as he speaks to us, as he opens your word. Uh, we just ask that even in the process of sharing with us, that he will be blessed too. Mm -hmm. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Carl. Good morning. I feel very grateful to be invited to share with you this morning. And uh, when Elder Fancher called me and asked me to speak this morning, he told me the theme, will your anchor hold, and kind of the story behind that. And he said, so think about that and put together some presentations that you think would fit with that. So I was thinking about your anchor holding and security and those types of things. And the two things that I want to share with you today and tomorrow is today I want to talk about our identity, who we are. Because until we understand who we are, our mission is not going to be accomplished. So I want us to understand our identity, and I believe that our identity is tied up and incredibly closely to our surety of salvation in Jesus Christ. If we don't have that surety, if we don't have that salvation experience, we have nothing. It is what everything else goes with. So I want to talk to you about identity today, mission tomorrow, and uh, believe that the Lord will bless us as we journey together over these messages. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of being here. Thank you that... Um, you are here with us. We believe your promise that where two or three are gathered together, you are there in their midst. You are here with us through your Holy Spirit, and we need that. Lord, it's beautiful outside. If I weren't here, I'd be tempted to be out there somewhere. But we've come here because we believe that you have something for us. So teach us. May the words that I speak be the words that you want me to speak, and may the words that are heard be the words that are needed. In Jesus' name, amen. I recently had to buy a new gas can, five-gallon gas can. I had a little tiny one that worked for a while, but I needed a big gas can, a five-gallon gas can. And so I went to the hardware store, and I looked at the lineup. And I was looking at the different gas cans, and as I was looking... I saw one that captured my attention, and it looked very much like the one on your screen. And it said on it these words, easy, poor, nozzle. Some of you are already shaking your head, right? And I thought to myself, easy, poor, nozzle. That's exactly what I need. I don't want gasoline going all over the place. I want something that will pour smoothly and sleekly and easily into the gas can on my lawnmower. And so I grabbed the easy pour gas can, purchased it, and went home. A few days later, I needed to mow the lawn. I had about an hour to get this job done before I had to be somewhere. And so I ran to the gas station and filled up my easy pour gas can with gasoline. I came home and I took the gas can and lifted it up to the lawnmower tank and tipped it up and waited for liquid to come out of it. And nothing would come out of it. Nothing. Zip. No gasoline. And I thought, I thought this was a easy pour nozzle on my gas can, right? And so, you know, I'm fairly mechanically inclined. Just don't ask my wife. But I think that I'm quite mechanically inclined. I took the nozzle off. I looked through it. It looked pretty good to me. I didn't see any reason why the gas shouldn't be pouring out of it. So I put it back on, and I lifted up the easy pour gas can to pour it in again to my lawnmower. And nothing, nothing, not a drop. Okay, at this point... Even though I'm a Christian, I'm starting to lose my Christian experience. I'm starting to think, what's going on here? This is supposed to be an easy, poor nozzle. And so I thought, there must be directions somewhere on the gas can that I'm not following. And so 
As I've gotten older and my age, I've had to purchase these things. Some of you maybe know what they are. They're reader glasses, and when I need to see things up close. So I got my reader glasses out, and I looked at the gas can, and sure enough, there on the nozzle was a number one and a number two. But that's all it said, number one and number two. There were no directions with number one, no directions with number two. It was just number one and number... That is not helpful to me. So I said, okay, enough of the easy pour nozzle. I took the nozzle off completely. I got a funnel off of my shelf. I put the funnel in the gas tank on the lawnmower. And I began to pour. And you're shaking your head again. Exactly. Because you know what gas cans do. They do this. Boo, boo, boo. And that's exactly what it was doing. And the gas was missing the funnel completely and going all over my lawnmower and all over the garage floor and all over me. And it stunk like gasoline. And I was like, oh, my word, this is embarrassing. My wife and I have just moved to a new neighborhood, and the neighbors keep their lawns fairly nice there. My next-door neighbor's name is Butch, and he mows every day, right? Right? <laughs> What if Butch sees me spilling gasoline? I can't even get gasoline into my lawnmower. What's Butch going to think? I started to get embarrassed. I was looking around the neighborhood to see if anybody else noticed that I don't know how to put gasoline into my lawnmower. I didn't know what to do. Like I said, I had a short amount of time to get the job done. I finally put the nozzle back on. I thought, I'll just, I'll try it one more time. And I lifted it up and I put it in. And maybe you can see on the picture, but there's a little tab on the nozzle. And that little tab, this last desperation shot, caught on the lip of the gas tank on the lawnmower and pushed it up, allowing the gas to be released, and it filled right up. It really was an easy poor nozzle. I just didn't know how, what, to use it, right? And it's embarrassing. They were recording this. This is going to go all around the world, and there, people around the world are going to say, oh, that guy is not bright, right? <laughs> but the reality of the fact is everything can be simple once you know how. But until you know how, the simplest and easiest things can be overwhelming to us. So it is, I think, sometimes with the gospel, with salvation. You know, as Christians, most of us who are here probably have been walking with the Lord for a number of years. And so we use these terms of justification and sanctification and righteousness by faith. And we throw them out left and right. And we kind of think we know what they mean. But there are many people who don't. And we just assume everyone understands these terms. And sometimes I really wonder if we do. So there are people who who want this simple, easy, poor nozzle, help me understand the gospel. And we're saying, oh, it's really simple. But we're not explaining it to them. So there may be some of you here today who need the simplicity of the gospel, and we will get to that in just a moment. Others of us maybe have been walking with the Lord for a number of years, and we remember the days, I still remember the days when I was so excited when I first met Jesus for myself, when I began that relationship with him as a young man, when I was digging into the word, and every time I read it, I got something out of it. And it's like my brother and I kind of came alive and were converted at the same time. I remember us laying in bed at at nighttime, and I said, have you ever read this text? And I jump up and turn on the light and read it to him. And then I jump back in bed, and he said, yeah, that's a good one. What about this one? And he'd jump up and turn on the light and read one. I mean, we were jazzed. We were excited. Jesus had changed our life. He'd forgiven our sins. He'd made us into something new, and we knew it, and we were excited, and we were jazzed, and it was simple, and it was clear. And I decided... At some point that maybe I would become a pastor, maybe study theology, maybe devote my life to, to sharing Jesus with other people. And I remember as a freshman theology major, you know, still jazz, still alive, still excited about Jesus. And I remember one day a man came up to me knowing that I was a theology major and he said to me, did you know 
that Ellen White says that you can't go to heaven unless you know every little detail of the sanctuary. I said, I didn't know that. He goes, it's true. And all of a sudden, my joy, my excitement, my enthusiasm started to become clouded because I thought, I don't know all the details of the sanctuary. I don't know anything about theology at this point. I know nothing. I'm a freshman theology major with really ignorant about those issues. And it unsettled me. It made me study, but it unsettled me. By the way, she does say that Jesus can be seen in all the different aspects of the sanctuary, but I've never read where you have to know that information to get into heaven. So we have some struggles. Maybe we've never had it explained to us simply, and maybe we've had people like that who have confused us and sometimes taken things out of context that either Scripture or Ellen White says. One of the scriptures that sometimes creates doubt in our minds to our sure salvation is this one in Christ's Object Lessons, page 155. We quote this one line that says, Those who accept the Savior, however sincere their conversion, should never be taught to say or to feel that they are saved. Wow. You mean I can never feel like I'm saved? I can never say that I'm saved? I mean, if we take that statement and just run with it, we can demolish our security in Christ, our security in salvation, our security and identity in Christ, and it has a negative effect, which I'll talk to you about in a moment. But what people don't say when they share a quote like that is that the context in which she is saying this is that she's speaking against a false theology called once saved, always saved. The idea that we can continue on in our sin and still think that we're secure in our salvation. That's false, and that's what she's speaking against. But that's not what people say. They just quote this one sentence, and we read it, and we say, okay, I'm never going to be secure. The Bible says... I write these things to you that you may know that you have eternal life. We've got to know that we're secure. We've got to know that we have salvation. It is not wrong to say I am secure in Christ. Not because I'm so good, but because he is. And our trust is in him. So there is confusion and there are context issues. And then there's this whole idea of not being good enough. We all know it. Even on our best days, we're not good enough. I'm not good enough. I mean, when we get to heaven, there's not one of us that's going to say, yes, I was good enough. There's not one of us. We all know that when we get there, we're going to fall at Jesus' feet and say, thank you that you were good enough. But there's this thing within us, and I think it's a human thing that says, i got to be better. i got to be good enough if I'm not good enough. I've determined that if I ever get to the point where I think I've met perfection, that I've reached perfection, all I have to do is move. My wife and I moved recently. Not a big move, right? Just 15 minutes from we were renting and we bought a house and we moved to that new house recently. And, you know, there's changing the utilities. There's um, picking colors, you know. Men, when your wife says, what color do you think? Do not answer that, okay? Do not answer that. Where do you think the furniture should go in this room? The answer is, what do you think, right? Yeah. Yeah. All those things are swirling around, not to mention the fact that you actually have to move your possessions from one house to another. And I always seem to get tired and hungry and empty, and I find myself being snappy with a woman who loves me, who's never done anything but good to me, who's always been kind to me. Why am I being snappy to her? Why am I treating her that way? If I ever think that I've reached perfection, all I have to do is move. Life can roll around along pretty easy, right? Up where we are, I live up near Memphis, Tennessee, and the traffic around Memphis, T- Tennessee is horrendous. It's awful. You know, it's a good day. You're moving along. Traffic's going good. But as soon as a, there's a hang-up, it's like, what's going on? 
and I realize I haven't quite arrived yet. My patience isn't where it should be, and I know that about me. And the devil knows that about me, and the devil loves to use that information to discourage us, to pull us down, to get us to give up, to, to lose faith, to stop trusting in Christ and say, see, you're not good enough, and to begin to doubt. We also struggle with the reality that it's too good to be true. The gospel is too good to be true. And we live in a world of cynicism and, and, and everyone's trying to get something from us. Everything's a scam, you know. There's always people fishing online, trying to get money out of you, trying to deceive you, trying to get something from you. And if there is an ad that says something that's remarkable and it's free, you know, just to move right along. And so when Jesus comes along and says, I'm going to give you eternal life and it's free, it's easy for us to say, what's the catch? So there are all kinds of complications to the gospel. And again, I'm sharing this with you as we begin these, this message and tomorrow's message. Because unless we understand and secure ourselves in Christ, in the gospel, in salvation, we have no mission Tomorrow I'll talk about mission, but today we've got to talk about identity, and our identity is found in Christ. And if we don't have security in our salvation, several things happen. This is a picture of my wife and I. Imagine this. Imagine that every time I communicated with my wife, I began the, with the line, you don't want to be married to me anymore, do you? You know, for instance... I call her this morning, actually. We had prayer this morning together. And what if I started the conversation with, you don't want to be married with me anymore, do you? And then I send her a text message. And before I ask her how her day's going, I say, you don't want to be married to me anymore, do you? Right? And after work, after we haven't seen each other all day and we see each other, before we hug each other and say, how are you? How was your day? I say to her, you don't want to be married to me anymore, do you? And this goes on and on and on for months and months and months. Every interaction with my wife, I say, you don't want to be married with me anymore, do you? Do you think that would affect my marriage? Of course it was. But that's exactly what we do to Jesus. We say, I'm not good enough. He says, no, I am. Right? He says, I, we say, I don't understand this passage. He says, okay, I'm with you. I'll take care of you. I'll forgive you. I'll redeem you. Just keep coming back to me. Abide in me. Stay with me. Right? It would destroy my marriage if I continually doubted my wife's love who has given me no question as to her fidelity and love towards me. It would destroy our marriage. And we, we do the same thing with Christ. We push him away continually, either by priorities, choices, etc. And when we do that, we lose our joy. How many of you have had a bad day? Raise your hand if you've had a bad day. Okay. But as Christians, isn't it nice to know that on a bad day, you are still forgiven. You are still right with God. You still have eternal life. You still have purpose in life as a child of God. You are redeemed. Go on and on and on and on and on. On our worst days, it's better than the pagans. On our worst days, when everything falls apart, we still have a foundation. We still have an anchor. We still have a place where we're secure. The world doesn't have that. We are in good hands. But if we begin to doubt, if we begin to believe that it's not true, if we think, oh, I can't say that I'm secure in my salvation, then our joy is removed. You can have joy on your worst day if you are in Christ. Secondly, we, use, we lose our witness. If we are not sure in our salvation, we lose our witness. There's this awesome story. We're going to look at Matthew 9 in just a minute. But there, there's this awesome story in Matthew 9 where Jesus heals two blind men. And after Jesus heals the two blind men, he says to them, Scripture says, sternly, Jesus says to them, sternly, don't tell anyone about this, right? And the very next line says, they told everyone in the entire region what the Lord had done for them. That's witness. Friends, 
get this, what Jesus did for those two blind men is nothing compared to what he has done for us by redeeming us from darkness into light. What he has done for us has transformed our lives. And when we get that, when we experience that, when that transformation comes into our life, it, it changes us, it moves us. And we can't keep it to ourselves. We can't keep it in. It's just like, you know what happened to me? But if we don't have that security, if we're not stable and secure in the Lord, we lose our witness. Third, if we're not focused on, on our surety in Christ, on the gospel, on being secure with him, we begin to focus on trivial matters. Pastor Shane talked about that a little bit this morning at 630 Trivial matters like we want, <clears throat> we want to appear spiritual, but inside we know that we're not. So I'm going to act spiritual so that people will think that I'm spiritual, even though I'm not. And most of the time, this kind of trivial thinking and behavior revolves around telling other people what they shouldn't be doing. Analyzing what they're eating, what they're wearing, etc. We spend our time on trivial matters. Just this morning, this is so pertinent to what Pastor Shane said this morning. Just this morning, one of my church members on Facebook posted something that is fake news. And she was obviously all upset about it. And I just texted her and said, just remember, not everything is real. But it's so easy for us to get caught up in the trivial when our spiritual lives are surface instead of being solidly spiritual in Christ. And last, we lose our identity. Several years ago, I was visiting a young man. He was college age. He lived in a house with two other single guys going to college. If you ever visit three young single men who are going to college, make sure your tetanus shot is up because it was an incredible, well, anyway, you get the idea. But this guy, his name was Jake, is Jake. Jake had this dog, and this dog was a miniature Australian shepherd, tricolor blue eyes, cool dog. I love dogs, right? And he, that dog had just been to the beauty parlor, right? She was all oh, beautiful, you know. And I was petting that dog. I said, man, this is a gorgeous dog. I love this dog. And I went on and on to Jake about how much I liked his dog. And anyway, visited about other things, went my way. A few months later, Jake calls me up. He says, Carrie, you said you really like the dog, right? I said, yeah. He goes, do you want it? And I said, yes. And so I got this dog, this beautiful Australian Shepherd, and I, I, I said, she's so beautiful, I'm just so happy to have her. But I didn't know she was dysfunctional, <laughs> right? Now, those, that breed of dog is very intelligent, and they want to work, they want to be active, which is fine, I knew that. But this dog had been messed up somewhere along the way. This dog, this dog had started out, and I don't know why they use that kind of a dog to do it, but they tried to teach it how to be a like a service dog for elderly people so it had to be very calm and sit at the feet of a wheelchair you know and I think it messed the dog up because that dog should have been running you know and then it never fit in anywhere you know so it got traded when I got it I was like the fourth or fifth owner it didn't know who its owner was so it has all this confusion in its head so you know it kept running away I'm like, I'm feeding it, I'm loving it, I'm taking care of it. It keeps running away because it doesn't know where it belongs. It, that dog did not ever learn its identity. It never belonged to me. You know how dogs connect with you eventually and they're yours and they stay by your side? That dog would never connect. It would never connect because it didn't know its identity. And when we aren't anchored to Christ, securing his salvation, we are not aware of who we truly are the sons and daughters of God. So today, I'm going to share with you in simple terms a gospel message. Maybe you've heard this verse before. Maybe you've read it so many times you don't read it anymore. Maybe it's lost meaning to you, but it's one of the simplest, clearest forms of the gospel and scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life or everlasting life. 
So the first line, for God so loved the world that he gave, is a message saying to you and to me that we are loved. We are loved by the God of the universe, and the proof of that love is the giving of his son, Jesus Christ. If you ever doubt it, on your worst day, no matter if it seems like God never answers a prayer for you, go back to the cross and look at the cross and be reminded that God does love you. You are loved. God communicates that to us. Years ago, I got in the mail something that's called an interest card. An interest card is a little card that's often given out in the back of a book or literature so that people can fill it out and request Bible studies. And so I got this card in my office. I saw it. I called the guy up. I asked him if he'd like to have Bible studies. And he said yes. So we set up an appointment. I went to his house. I rang the doorbell. I heard it ring inside. Nothing. I knocked on the door. Nothing. I rang the doorbell. I heard it ring inside. I knocked vigorously. No one came to the door. I rang the doorbell. I knocked on. You get the idea. No one was home. No one came to the door. No TV was on. No radio was on. Nothing was going on inside the house. He was not home. So I left. A couple days later, I called him up. I said, hey, I'm sorry we missed each other. Could we reschedule? Uh, and he said, of course, I'm sorry. I had to work late. And so I went to his house again at the appointed time, the appointed day and time. I went to the door, and you know, I rang the doorbell, and I heard it ring inside. I knocked on the door vigorously. No one came to the door. I went home. I called him up. I said, hey, if you don't want to study, it's okay. Just be honest with me. No, I really want to study with you. Okay, well, is there a time that works for you? And we set up another appointment, and I went to his house, and I rang the doorbell. I heard it ring inside. I knocked vigorously on the door. No one came to the door. Again, he stood me up. I went home, and a few days later, I called him up. He did not answer the phone. A few days later, I tried him again. He did not answer the phone. He turned in a card that said, I want to study the Bible. But did he want to study the Bible? No, not with me anyway, okay? God does not stand in heaven and say, I love you, good luck. God says, I love you and gave his son to make us right with him. So that we can be in relationship throughout scripture from beginning to end. You see this story of an alienated people that God is fighting to redeem and fighting to be reconnected with. And fighting to say, I want my dwelling place and your dwelling place to be the same place. You are loved. And so I send you my son. Our part. You got to believe it you got to believe that God loves you and that Jesus Christ is his son that came and accomplished a mission he was sent to accomplish. Do you believe that? This is where I want to go to Matthew 9 for just a moment. If you have your Bibles, feel free to open up there. I just want to share a couple verses with you there. Matthew chapter 9, I've been reading through the book of Matthew in my personal devotion time. And I, I read through it last week or a couple weeks ago. And when I read I was just like, Wow! This is amazing. In one chapter, Jesus heals a paralytic, raises a dead girl from the dead, uh, heals a woman that's been sick for 12 years, uh, heals the two blind men that I talked about earlier, and casts a demon out of a mute man so that he can speak, all in chapter 9. That's quite a chapter, right? Quite a chapter. When you get to verse 22, he's talking to the woman who'd been sick for 12 years who'd been healed, Jesus turned to her and saw her and said, take heart, daughter. And he said, your faith has healed you. Your what? Your faith. Okay. Now skip down to verse 29. Verse 29, he's healing the, the two blind guys. And he says, he touched their eyes and said, according to your faith, will it be done to you? According to your what? Faith. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes, whoever has faith. 
In chapter 9 of the book of Matthew, these people had faith in Jesus. And because they had faith in Jesus, he was able to work in their lives in a miraculous way. Now here's what you got to get, what I got to get. What did they see in Jesus? This was not just another faith healer. This was not just another prophet. This was not just another teacher. This wasn't another Pharisee. This wasn't another rabbi. This wasn't just another guy trying to scam people. Who was this guy? They saw something in Jesus that brought forth faith. They saw in Jesus something that humanity had never seen before. They saw God. And because they saw God, their faith went out. Think about it. This woman had been sick for 12 years. According to Ellen White, she had spent everything she had on doctors who had not been able to heal her. If you were in that situation, you would have given up. If you would have been in that situation, you would have just stayed home. If you would have been in that situation, we said, I'm not trusting anyone ever again. They've all failed me. But when she saw Jesus... Something changed. When she saw Jesus, she said, this is not just a faith healer. This is God. I think this guy has it. And she reached out and touched the hem of his garment and was healed. And Jesus says, take heart, daughter. Your faith has made you whole. I mean, think about that. Think about this story of the man who comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, my daughter's dead. If you have some time, would you mind swinging by and just resurrect her? No. He, death is serious. Death is not flippant. Death is sad. Death is heavy. This guy's heart was broken. I have a daughter. If my daughter died, I would, my heart would be ripped out. He took the risk. He saw in Jesus something he didn't see. He didn't go to a Pharisee. He didn't go to a religious leader. He didn't go to a pastor. He didn't go to a preacher. He went to God. And he said, God, you gave her life. You can give her life again. And Jesus did it. It's amazing. These stories are given because we don't have, we haven't had yet the privilege of seeing Jesus face to face. We haven't seen those eyes yet. We haven't heard that voice yet. We haven't felt that touch yet. But they did. And they knew through that experience that that was God. And it brought forth faith in them. So I just have to pause here and say, do you have faith? Do you have that kind of faith? Do you see who Jesus really is? Do you recognize he's not just another prophet, not just another guy hanging out, not just another good guy, good guy? He's the savior of the world. He's the God who created us. And because of that, when he says, it is. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life for everlasting life. We talk a lot in the Adventist church about healthy living and studies have been done that show that because of a healthy lifestyle we live longer. But that's not the kind of eternal life that's being referred to here. It's talking about an eternal life that begins the moment we place our faith in Jesus Christ. It's talking about an eternal life where there's no more sickness or death or sadness or mourning. It's talking about an eternal life that when I place my faith in Jesus, I have life more abundantly. I know what my life's purpose is. I know that there's a reason for my existence. I know that my horrid past has been forgiven. I know I've been made right with the Father. I know that uh, the moment I speak Jesus' name, I'm heard in heaven. I know the Holy Spirit intercedes with groanings too deep with words. I know all of these things are mine as part of eternal life. I'm excited about Jesus coming back. I'm excited about the fact that we get to go to heaven. Those are good, good, good things. Amen? But I'm also excited about the fact that I don't have to wait until then to begin eternal life. Scripture says that 
my body and your bodies are the temple, the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. Scripture says that the Holy Spirit is a deposit of what's coming. Eternal life's begun for us. Let's smile. Let's say thank you. Let's live in grace. Let's enjoy the eternal life that God has given to us. Let's be sure and solid and secure. Philip Dunham is an Adventist pastor, retired Adventist pastor, wrote a book called Sure Salvation. And in that book, he shares this illustration. He said there once was a, a homeless boy in Chicago. He lived in an alley in a cardboard box, and it was wintertime, and it was cold. He sold newspapers on the street corner to try and make a little money so he could have some food to eat. So he's on the street corner, snowing, winter, winds blowing in Chicago, and he is cold, cold, cold. And a police officer walks up to him. He says it's a pretty cold night for a young boy to be out. And he said, sir, do you know any place that a boy could go to get warm? Police officer looks down at him and he says, I tell you what, go down the block, go to the middle of the block, and there you'll see this big white house. Go up to the big white house and knock on the door. And when the door is open, say, John 3, 16. Little boy had nothing to lose, and he was tired of being cold. So he walked down the street, and sure enough, there was a big white house. He went up to the door. He knocked on the door, and when the door opened, there was this beautiful grandmotherly lady who opened the door. And he looked up at her, and he said, John 3, 16. And she swung the door open for him. He came inside, knocked the snow off, and she took off his ratty old coat and put a blanket around him and said, Come here. And she put him inside the living room, and there was a roaring fire. And he sat down in front of that fireplace, and he's warming his hands, and for the first time in what seemed like weeks, he could start to feel his fingers and his toes again, and he's starting to feel good, and the, the lady left the room to do something else, and while he was sitting there, this thought went through his head. He, he thought, John 3.16, I don't understand it, but it sure makes a cold boy warm. The lady comes back a few minutes later and she says, come upstairs, you need to get cleaned up. So she took him upstairs where she had drawn this warm bubble bath. The boy hadn't had a bath in way too long. She said, get cleaned up, there's a new set of clothes, put those on and then come down and I'll get you something to eat. So he gets in the bathtub and he's scrubbing up and it feels so good, the warm water on him. And he's cleaning up and again the thought goes through his head, John 3.16. I don't understand it, but it sure makes a dirty boy clean. He gets out of the tub and dries off and puts on his new set of clothes and He's feeling pretty good now, and he goes downstairs, and when he walks into the dining room, here is his table, and on the table is more food than he's ever seen in his life. And he begins, to, he sits down, and the lady says, eat all you want, and she, he begins eating and eating and eating. And again, the thought goes through his head, John 3, 16, I, I don't understand it, but boy, sure makes a hungry boy full. As he's finishing his meal, the lady comes in and says, do you know what John 3.16 means? And he said, no, ma'am. She said, when you're done eating, come by the fire. I want to talk to you. So when he finishes up eating, he goes into the living room again and sits down next to her by the fire. And she pulls out her Bible and reads John 3.16 and begins explaining it to him. And while she's talking to him, the thought goes through his head, John 3.16. I don't understand it, but it sure makes a boy happy. Right. Friends, I have two theology degrees. If we wanted to, we could take and parse all of the Greek words of John 3.16. I could give you all the background information and talk about Nicodemus and talk about all the other things going on in John 3.16. We could analyze it and look at it every direction, but the truth of the matter is, despite all of those things... 
I still don't understand John 3.16. I will never understand how a God, a perfect God in heaven, loved this fallen sinner so much that he would give up, forsake his son to us to kill him. It will never make sense to me. I will never fully understand and comprehend it. But what I do understand of it has transformed my life. Has made me a different man. Has has given me purpose and meaning and direction in life. It has given me identity. There's so many stories that I could tell you about my life where it's like without God in it, I would have lost it. I would be dead. I would be lost. And you too, you have those stories too. I share this message with you today, not because you haven't heard it before, but because salvation is something that we so easily just slip by. Oh yeah, I got that on to deeper things. But if we pass it by without being secure in it, we will never, and I mean never, be what God desires for us to be. And we will never, I mean never, accomplish the mission that he's called us to. So I want to challenge you and to me. I want us to go back to the gospel. I want us to experience again for the first time. I want you to think about those experiences that God gave you when you first met him. I want you to go to passages like John 3, 16 and Ephesians chapter 2 and Romans chapter 3 and read the gospel again and hear it again and let it speak to your heart because God has called us and wants us to be secure in him. And when we are, the mission that he's called us to, we're unstoppable, unstoppable. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity we have to join together to open your word, to encourage and motivate and inspire by the gift of your Holy Spirit. Lord, each person here has a walk with Jesus, but maybe it's grown stale. Maybe we've become confused. Maybe, I don't know, maybe life has just pushed it out. This is a call, Lord. This is a call to myself and each one of us here to return to the gospel as the base, foundation, root of our existence and our identity. And I pray that you would provoke all of us through your Holy Spirit to seek you more fully and to be sure in Christ of what we have, of what you've done, and who we are because of it. Thank you for being with us. We praise you. And thank you in Jesus' name, amen.